So while I was away on Christmas break, I found myself quite often itching to get back to play some more Fallout 76. Of course, I had a nice time seeing my family and enjoying the holidays and all, but it gave me a chance to explore what exactly was fueling this desire to get back to post-apocalyptic Appalachia with my tricked out auto pistol and portable Lego set. And in this video, I'm going to share with you what I uncovered. Now there's been a lot of scathing reviews about Fallout 76 and it's been rather well deserved. It rolled out as a buggy mess, it lacks a deeply compelling plot compared to its predecessors, especially my favorite New Vegas, and the absence of human NPCs leads to a feeling of lonely abandon. And you know, the retcons as well as the multiplayer aspect kills the feeling of immersion for fan purists of the series. And I'm no exception. I made a granddaddy of a rant video about the game consisting of a 45 minute expose on why the game was such a disappointment. But I also said in that video, as well as a few videos before it, that in some way, somehow, the game was still growing on me. And I wanted to create a follow up video exploring those feelings. So I'm going to invite you into what some of my mind has been processing over the last month and a half in this video. By the end of the video, if you still feel like I'm acquiescing or even ratifying future trash games from Bethesda, then feel free to leave a comment saying as much. But one thing I can assure you of is that I'm being honest with my feelings in both of these videos. Like I said in a recent video, the game can be both bad and enjoyable at the same time. Like those can be mutually exclusive, and I'll wind my way through those seeming contradictions to shed some light on why. Let's begin with the beginning of the game, both in terms of its real-world launch as well as your character's launch in the game itself. We'll start with the real-world launch. Like I said in my Afterburn video, I have no idea why they launched the game in this condition. If all it had to do with was holiday sales, and they let the marketing suits win over common sense, because there are plenty of good games launching this spring that have nothing to do with holiday sales. Like next month, for example, two huge post-apocalyptic games, Metro Exodus and Far Cry New Dawn, they're not launching near a holiday unless you're going to get, you know, your significant other one of the games for Valentine's Day or something. Here you go, honey. I love you. Go kill some mutants. I don't know. Maybe they didn't want to compete with those games, but it was a poor decision to roll out the game in the condition it was in. And I say that because they actually have fixed a lot of the bugs since the rollout. You were wondering how I was going to spin this into a positive, weren't you? But seriously, I'm impressed with how quickly they're attacking the problems that arise. I'm not experiencing nearly the amount of server disconnections that I was when I first started playing the game. I'm not losing control of access as much anymore, and the sign-in process is getting more reliable. Now, those problems are still happening, but not nearly at the frequency they were when the game first rolled out, or even a month after. Now, as I mentioned in my Afterburn video, super stupid of them to let their first impressions be their worst impressions. But the good news is that things are indeed getting fixed, which leads to another point. Because of the online nature of the game, they're able to make fixes more quickly than they could with Fallout 4. Because a lot of the problems are directly in their hands. There still are these massive patch rollouts, but there's also a lot of quiet work going on behind the scenes too. And because they're able to patch things more quickly, I feel like the game has the potential to be a much smoother ride down the road. Is that an excuse for the aging game engine or anxiety or loss of time inflicted on the community? Of course not. But what we witnessed in the beginning was basically the worst it can be. There's nowhere else it can go but up. And I'm just talking about stability issues. I'm not talking about other areas they could bottom out, like over-commercializing the atomic shop or getting downright grub fest greedy with it. That's another discussion for another time. But as far as playability goes, if someone buys the game now at its discounted price, they'll have gotten a much better deal and avoided the suffering that most players went through in the first few weeks. As the saying goes, pioneers get killed. Now let's shift out of the real world into the in-character playability and I'll explain what I mean. The game is absolute agony for starting characters. Let me say this and I'll go into more detail. Trust me, the game gets better as you level up. Much better. So much, in fact, that not even a seasoned gamer like me could have predicted how much. I feel like a lot of people may have given up on the game before, say, level 10 or 20 and didn't give their character a chance to get a grasp on the world and its rules. So, when I first started playing, my character was getting hit by everything left and right. And I'm not talking about the monsters. I'm talking about the perils of survival, like hunger, thirst, radiation, disease, the sketchy durability of weapons and armor, and the lack of resources to do anything to absolve yourself of these perils. Now, I know some of you out there think you're so tough, you know. What'd you expect, bro? It's a survival game. Yeah, okay, hold your horses there, Davy Crockett. There are plenty of action-adventure games out there that don't delve into this level of survival grind and rinse and repeat style minutia. They tend to focus more on the action and adventure part. You know, maybe even a little storytelling? I don't think your average gamers are quite prepared for what Fallout 76 is. When Todd Howard said 
this game is softcore survival, he was either lying or misinformed about his own game. This game is hardcore survival, and if you weren't prepared for that, then your first 10 to 20 levels are going to be a real drag. And it was worse for people like me who like to come out of the vault and just go exploring and not be tethered to the main quest right out of the gate. That's what I did. I came out of Vault 76 and immediately started heading east and started exploring some of the funky illustrations on the map. You know, I was like, wow, there's something over here that looks like a big palace or a spooky cave over here. Big mistake, all right? I was routinely running into enemies that were three, four, or even five times my level around every bend. Why? Well, because it's not like Fallout 4. No one told me you need plans to build things to craft ammo or cure disease. I mean, you can't expect casual players to buy the game and then go watch a bunch of other YouTubers tell them how to do it first. That's ridiculous. But now that I'm around 55th level, I feel like I got a really good grasp on the rules of the world and my character hardly ever gets diseased anymore, runs out of food or rat away. His weapons and armor aren't breaking anymore and he's finally morphed into the ghost sniper that I wanted. But he's that way after investing a bunch of perks into mitigating those grindy elements. If I had just followed the overseer's directions like a good little sheep, I probably wouldn't have had such a hard time. But generally speaking, the learning curve for this game is pretty steep and it does take a while to build your character up. I mean, my Assassin's Creed Odyssey character was a serious badass after only like 30 hours into the game. 30 hours into Fallout 76 and you're barely done wiping your runny nose. So that's another reason why the game is growing on me. You know, I paid my dues and now my character rocks pretty hard. Well, he could always use more perks and legendary items, of course, but I mean, he rocks in the sense that I don't have to run away from every angler or saltron I see anymore. I still avoid Scorch Beast, but that's not uncommon at my level. I think a lot of this could have been avoided if they had just had a few human NPCs in the beginning walking you through some early tutorial-style quests. I know that may sound a little hand-holdy to some players, and I know the Overseer sort of does that through some holotapes, but it just doesn't work for the average gamer. I think Bethesda sort of overestimated how much players will play like they wanted or expected. I think a lot of people gave up on the game too early as a result. Anyway, if you're seeing this and you're just starting the game or thinking about exploring the game, think of Vault 76 on the map like the center of a series of circles that radiates outwards in difficulty with the hardest parts of the map being the right and bottom edges of the map. If you want to shoot out of the vault west to Point Pleasant, or maybe some areas in the middle of the map, you're probably okay. But no, it's not like Fallout 4 as some might lead you to believe, because White Springs, which is sort of the equivalent to Diamond City, is surrounded by ridiculously high-level enemies, and everyone likes to nuke White Springs anyway. You know, there were several times where I started making my way down to White Springs only to hear an air horn and see death from above coming, and you probably can't afford anything the vendors have to offer there yet anyway, and there aren't really any quests like there were in Diamond City. You know, so just work on getting used to the survival grind first and know that it won't be such a chore later in the game. The next reason why the game has grown on me is that there are actually some cool locations to investigate on the map. Now, I'm not giving the game a pass on its aging graphics, you know, the visuals still leave a lot to be desired, as I strongly pointed out in my Afterburn video. But, as you get used to the less than competitive graphics, you'll find some really exciting places to be discovered. Let's put it this way, as much as they recycled a lot of the assets from past games, ironically, there is also a lot of diversity. And while I think the map has long stretches of boring hinterlands, there are some thrilling places to explore. In some cases, they might be like haunted cabins with paintings that spin on the walls and blood-curdling screams heard outside. In other cases, they might be incredibly tall structures spanning the mountainside. And the terrain actually changes significantly from different regions on the map. You know, something I don't remember too much of in past Fallout games. For example, the region they call the forest over here has a completely different feel than the area that they call the ash heap or the cranberry bog even so much as the way the structures are built. So, I gotta give him credit for that. Also, the atmosphere itself changes too. Like from the environmental sounds to the colors, to even the ambient music will change from region to region. I like that a lot, actually. I know I complained about the vast stretches of nothingness at times and how they sort of stretch things out unnecessarily, but if I have to walk around like I do, it is sort of relaxing sometimes. They did a decent job with the music composition, you know, it's hard to describe. It sort of has elements of a Native American vibe mixed with a haunted New Age vibe or something. I don't know, I'm just riffing here. But you can't relax early in the game or the creatures will jump out and kill you. My character is so stealthy now, you can hear a monster coming and squat down and they'll just walk right by me. Oh, and some of you guys might be able to confirm that in the comments or not, but I think certain creatures are native to only certain regions. I, you know, I could be wrong. I know the Scorched are everywhere, and that's unfortunate because they're like the most annoying new enemy in the game. But I, I really like the Mole Men. I think they're creepy. 
you know, I think I like them because they actually bother to voice them a little bit. You know, when you're exploring an area with the mole men, you'll hear their creepy banter and it really sets the mood. Definitely has like a sci-fi vibe or something, which is something we often forget about Fallout, which actually leads to my next point. Although there are a ton of recycled monsters, there are actually a lot of new ones too. Things like the Snallygasters and the Honey Beasts and the Mega Sloths and stuff. There's even a lot of little creatures that don't even need to be killed, like frogs and fireflies and foxes and beavers and squirrels. But the cryptids take the cake. They're actually really cool. From some of the more common ones like the Wendigo and the Grafton monsters to the Flatwoods monster and the Mothman. In my 55 levels so far, I've only run into the Flatwood monster and the Mothman once and both times they escaped. For now, I think the cryptids are severely underdeveloped, but they do offer an alluring tether to real world phenomenon and conspiracy theories. So I'm interested to see if there's more to them than just another kill, you know? I'm hoping maybe a DLC or something. The Flatwoods monster looks sort of like an alien, and you know, and there's an alien blaster I found in the game, so you never know. Speaking of creatures and such, another thing that's made an impression on me is that the enemy AI in this game is way smarter than in previous games. In fact, it's so smart that it can actually be a little jarring sometimes, you know? Enemies will actually run away from grenades, making you waste them a lot of the time. They'll duck behind cover, making combat last longer, and the AI will quickly navigate the most efficient path up to your perch sniping location even when the monsters shouldn't technically be that smart. But the smart AI does one thing very well in your favor. Enemies are enemies of each other as well. So you'll routinely see creatures fighting each other, which adds a welcome realism to the ecosystem. You can also lure creatures into fighting each other. Wish I had some good footage of that, but being a stealthy character, I've done that on many occasions. And if you manage to get at least one hit on each of the monsters, you'll get both XP and loot for them. Bats is not as bad as I thought it would be. It doesn't stop or slow time like in past games, but it's basically an auto-aimer. So if you see a hit percentage that's fairly high, you will hit the enemy no matter how fast they're bobbing or weaving. And it does spin your character around for you if a creature is running circles around you. So my concerns about Vats have been largely relieved and I find myself using it quite often. It also pinpoints distant or hard to see enemies, which is something we used Vats for in past games as well. I don't bother with limb shots anymore because combat moves too fast. If I want to get a clean head shot, I'll just do it from a distance. But overall, Vats works well. One of my biggest concerns was about being able to play solo. To my surprise, I've actually been able to play completely solo and not have too difficult a time surviving. In fact, maxing out the Lone Wanderer perk is pretty powerful in this game. I've even been able to survive doing several events myself. You know, I've had no problems with anybody griefing me, photobombing my recording, or attacking my base. In fact, in my nearly 200 hours of playing it so far, I've only run into other players a handful of times. Out of that handful of times, most of the encounters were a quick, you know, shared thumbs up and then we just went about our ways. I ran into a couple of people that wanted to trade, and one time I teamed up with someone to take out that wicked Assaultron in Sugar Grove. I went ahead and caved in and ordered a headset with a mic that I can plug directly into my controller, so I'll be able to chat with people in the game if I want now that they added that push to talk feature. But I mainly bought it because I want to do some future team ups with my Patreon supporters. The point being though, that you won't have any problem at all playing solo. In fact, you might find yourself in the opposite position where because of the lack of NPCs, you'll want to seek out social encounters in the game. That's something I actually predicted in my Afterthoughts video back in June. But overall, I think Bethesda went out of their way to deter griefing or overcrowding. And while it's still immersion killing to see a player run with a lewd or goofy gamer tag or wearing a bathrobe and a beaver mask and wielding a cough glove, it's pretty rare. I find most players just want to deck themselves out in something sleek or post-apocalyptic. And the PvP element is squarely under control. That's perfect for me because I'm not interested in killing other players. In fact, I almost feel a tiny bit sorry for players who wanted a battle royale game because unless another player is in the mood, you're pretty much SOL. Having said that, I have noticed that the game is getting a little more griefy in recent weeks. By that, I mean players who are out looking for a fight. This didn't happen at all in the first month and a half in the game. You know, everybody was walking on eggshells. But lately, I've had gangs of players descend on me and start beating on me looking to start a fight. Feels a little schoolyard-like in behavior, you know? Thankfully, they can beat on me all they want and even shoot me in the face and there's barely a scratch. I can just stand there and throw up funny emotes until I get bored and walk away. But it is a bit hostile and provocative and you gotta have thick enough of a skin to walk away without getting yourself into a revenge cycle. I think a lot of players might be getting bored of the game, you know? They finished all the quests, now they're looking for other things to do. I get it. That was bound to happen in an MMO with such limited story content. I think it would be hilarious if Bethesda somehow was able to 
properly code it so that if a player is shooting another player and he isn't shooting back, a tough monster spawns nearby and attacks them both. That would give him a chance to work together and kill the monster and maybe make a new friend. Or at the very least, give the immature player something to do while the uninterested player sneaks away. Until then, there are a bunch of funny things you can do to extract yourself from gang ups in a stylish way. I actually have a few videos for you guys that you're going to love on that topic. But I'll give you one example that comes to mind. So I was out hunting for the mound location of one of those treasure maps you can find, you know, which by the way, never seemed to give me any cool loot or plans that I want. Maybe I've just been unlucky. But anyway, all of a sudden these three goofballs surround me and start beating on me. You know, it felt very rude and intrusive because your first reaction is always like, what the hell dudes, you know, what did I do? The funny thing is, is that I was like level 50 and they were all around like level 15 to 20. I probably could have taken them, but instead I invited them to trade. They just kept rifle butting and pissed whipping me, which is almost more insulting than just shooting me. You know, that's the new thing now, by the way, so they can save ammo, you know, to see if you fight back. So what I finally did instead was turn on one of those phantom devices. I won't spoil it too much for you, but you get rewarded with plans to build phantom devices if you follow the Order of Mysteries quest line in the game. It's basically a combination of a smoke bomb, a frenzy weapon, and a stealth boy rolled into one. The frenzy part doesn't work on other players, I don't think, but what it does do is wig out their field of view for a second and turn you invisible. So I quickly and quietly slipped out of the circle in which they had surrounded me, made my way up to the top of a nearby cliff, and then looked down to see all three still standing there in utter confusion. I'm pretty sure it didn't stun them or anything. They were probably just talking amongst themselves about what the hell just happened. Anyway, it made my day. Now, having said that, in most other circumstances, the opposite of griefing can occur. You know, sometimes random players will help you out, and you'll find yourself doing the same. I was at around level 40 exploring the top of a building when I heard some gunfire down below. You know, I peeked over the edge, and I saw a level 12 player getting absolutely swarmed by ghouls. So, I took out my sniper rifle, and I picked off some of the ghouls to help him thin the herd. He still got hits on them, too, so he didn't lose any XP and got all the loot. But he looked up when it was over to see who had helped him out, and I waved from the top of the building. He gave me a thumbs up and I felt like I'd actually saved a fellow vault dweller, you know, my good deed for the day. Next thing you know, I was at a vendor shop in White Springs and for some reason the vendors were all out of caps, you know, maybe it was a a glitch because I thought vendors are supposed to have 200 cap limits for each player and not total for everyone in the room, but I could be wrong about this. So this friggin' 100th level player is leaving the shop. He couldn't hear my frustration because I didn't have a mic hooked up, but he probably sensed it. So he dropped a bag on the ground and pointed to it, gave me a thumbs up and left. Inside the bag was actually a bunch of wicked legendary weapons and some plans I didn't have. I was like, holy cow, that's awesome. So although you find the majority of your encounters with randoms basically just awkward, maybe even annoying, there are some redeeming moments to balance it out. Now, the building system in Fallout 76 leaves much to be desired, but the idea of allowing you to build anywhere in the world not already occupied by Landmark is actually very cool. A welcome change from Fallout 4 where you can only build in set locations without mods. And as you'll see in some upcoming videos, I've already taken that concept to the extreme and you guys are really going to like what I have planned for the Base Camp series. Now, I can't let them off the hook on this because the building system is extremely limited and challenging to finagle, but I'm seeing the building system Fallout 76 like a giant slingshot, right? They pulled way, way back from what you could do in Fallout 4, but like a slingshot being pulled back, it has the potential energy to shoot well beyond Fallout 4. They just need to spend some time working out more of the kinks. I also have some videos coming up with suggestions on how they can improve the building system, because I really do see the potential there. So those are all the major reasons why the game is growing on me. There are a lot of little details too that add up. First of all, they added a field of view slider to the settings, so I don't have to look out and view the distance anymore like the impressionist painting that I mentioned in my Afterburn video. Again, I don't know why these kind of things weren't there from the jump. Would have made a vastly better impression on the community. Now, there are a lot of other little details that I don't remember being there in Fallout 4, like they added little noises when you pick up junk. That was a nice touch. There are a ton more perks than in past games. Granted, a lot of them are there to at alleviate the survival grind, which seems like a waste. But even beyond that, there are many more perks and perk combination possibilities. I'll go over a few interesting combos in some upcoming videos. I wish they didn't cap the ability points at 50 though, because you can keep taking cards beyond 50, but you can't use them without the ability points available. I'm not a huge fan of the way they created the perk system in this game, to be honest. I know what they were going for, but something this essential to the logistics of gameplay really needs months of planning by the development team. And it seems like something that was just thrown together in mere weeks or even days. Maybe I'm just bitter because I have so many wasted card choices from my early levels while I was still learning how the game world worked. But generally speaking, there are
there are enough potential perk cards that you can play multiple kinds of builds that are completely different from one another if you don't mind starting over. Now the final reason why I think this game is growing on me has a little to do with psychology. Longtime viewers of the School Zone have heard me mention this in way old videos and it's also mentioned on my website, but I actually have a degree in psychology. I didn't go the full doctorate route and make a career of it, but I learned a lot of interesting things about how the world works during my schooling. There's a concept in psychology called the mere exposure effect. It's the idea that people will grow to like something through the mere exposure to it. You know, familiarity causes affinity. So that's another element at play here. First of all, I'm used to Fallout games and their DNA, and by merely exposing myself to that same DNA for as long as I have with Fallout 76, it's growing on me naturally. Now that doesn't invalidate all the other points I've made, but it does explain why I'm able to tolerate more and more of the misgivings that annoyed the hell out of me when I first started playing it. The same thing will happen to you, you know, you'll get used to the game and you look past the things about the game you'd wished it had been. Now combine that psychological element with another psychological element I've noticed about the game, Fallout 76 does a really good job of stimulating the reward centers in your brain and those dopamine pathways more so than in previous games. Basically, there's a lot of gambling going on, okay? And I don't mean in the traditional sense like casinos. I mean as far as giving you just enough of an enticement through random chance to keep at it. The sights and sounds are part of it too, but it's also rooted in the mechanics, whether that be seeing what cards pop up in card packs when you level up, all the way down to seeing if you'll get those building plans you've been longing for when you complete an event or claim a workshop. The element of chance is huge in this game, and through operant conditioning, it forces you to keep on keeping on, you know, hoping for that next positive reinforcement. I'm not saying that's necessarily a bad thing, you know, all games use these principles, but it does play heavily in Fallout 76. I can even see it having an effect on players with potential gambling addictions. There's a little bit of that in all of us, but it's not to be overlooked in Fallout 76. And I only mention this because it's one more factor among all the positive things I discussed on why the game is growing on me. I'm just hoping and praying they don't exploit this in the Atomic Shop. That's my gravest concern for the health and longevity of Bethesda. But I don't want to leave things on a sour note. Despite what some commenters may say, I do think Bethesda learned their lesson from the horrendous launch of Fallout 76. And look, if they didn't take heed of the wisdom they learned in Fallout 76, they're going to do so at their own peril. The developers and the design team need to grab their corporate overlords by the collar and shake some sense into them. I've said this on many occasions, integrity and authenticity wins the day. There are no shortcuts in that regard. But from what I've witnessed in the last few weeks, things are improving, you know, bugs are getting fixed, new features and content are being added, and they are even showing signs that they're listening to the community. These are wins for all sides. Bethesda may not have liked hearing all the negative criticism at first, but it did give them a wake-up call that they're on notice, and there are just too many other games out there for them to sit on their laurels. I'm going to be featuring a lot of Fallout 76 content going forward because I can share a lot of the wisdom on how to make your experiences smoother and more enjoyable, but I do hope Bethesda continues to listen to their fans and wins back their hearts and minds. Anyway, thanks for watching to the end guys. On to a series of much shorter videos now that I have these reviews under my belt. And of course, more Fallout 4 videos as well. Be sure to throw a like on this video and subscribe if you haven't already. And I'll see you next time on The School Zone. Stay smart!